If it is true that in repressive neurosis, certain emotions do not mature or remain infantile, how can we be sure that we are differentiating uh, deprivation neurosis? Okay, that's an important question. There are several relevant characteristics of a deprivation neurosis in this regard. So these are the ones to keep in mind. Number one, I would say absence of the excessive or what is known as hypertrophied fear or the energetic emotions of hope and courage. So there's an absence of these excessive fear or energy emotions. The second would be deprivation neurotic fear is not a volitional or willed fear of some object or sensory good such as sex or a loved one that tries to reject or escape to remain safe. But instead, we're talking about an existential fear because one feels inadequate to cope with one's existence, with one's life. A third relevant characteristic would be that deprivation neurotics have an open and uninhibited sensual or rational striving towards sense good, so they are capable of love, desire, and enjoyment of objects, of things such as dolls or teddy bears or games. They're, they're not afraid of them. They're not trying to escape them. I think a fourth relevant characteristic of a deprivation neurosis would be that there is then no fear-provoking object and no augmentation of new objects to become afraid of, but instead there's just a, a straight static clinical symptomatology in the deprivation neurotic. So again, we're talking about the difference between the deprivation neurosis and repressive neuroses. A fifth relevant characteristic would be that there is no sleep disturbance or dream features that are to be noted unless there's a superimposed pseudoneurotic reaction or repressive reaction. And these, of course, we're going to learn more about as we go along. And the sixth relevant characteristic would be that there are no ticks unless there's a superimposed pseudoneurotic reaction or repressive reaction. So I'd say these are the six most relevant characteristics.